hello everyone. Um, my name is Hamish Williams. I'm a researcher based at the Polish Institute of Advanced Studies in Warsaw currently. And I'm going to be talking to you today as part of this panel on labyrinths and their travelers about autistic, blind, and socially anxious mentals, postmodern monsters in the fiction of Stephen Cheryl, Ruth Rendell, and Peter Goldsworthy. Okay, so. So let's talk a bit about our modern fascination with Minotaur, because it is quite a modern fascination. The Minotaur myth, of course, originates uh, in classical Greek mythography, uh, with the writings of scattered fragments and the writings of uh, Plutarch and Diodorus Siculus about Minotaur, right? And obviously we have various uh, vase depictions of Theseus slaying a Minotaur here, the, the black figure vase depicted on the top left. Um, but in the post-classical period, which is really my focus as a classical receptionist, uh, we have very few references to Minotaurs or the Minotaur um, in the period before the 20th century, um, as far as I'm aware. So if you know of any, please uh, let me let me know. But on the top right there, we have maybe the most uh, noteworthy um, exception, which is uh, Dante's in Dante's Inferno, where Virgil and um, Dante uh, see the shame of Crete, uh, Minotaur, um, on the, I think it's the seventh, uh, near the seventh circle of hell, I think, or the ninth, I think seventh, yeah. Um, so, uh, and then suddenly in the 20th century, we see this sort of uh, great uh, out, you know, outburst of, of fascination with, with the Minotaur, right? Um, and, and part of this, I think, is a large part to, to do with this movement called Cretomania. Uh, we could also think of it as called a sort of a neo Minoanism, sort of a Minoan revival, analogous to the sort of Egyptian revival, right, in the early 20th century. So basically, when um, Arthur Evans, Arthur Evans found, um, rediscovered the, the ruins at Knossos, the sort of these, these Minoans of this Minoan civilization, we have this upsurge of interest by creative writers, artists, architects, um, psychoanalysts, uh, various cultural thinkers who are part of this modern myth-making enterprise, which we, we can think of as Cretomania or neo-Minoanism. Neo so creating the Minoans in a, in, a, in a modern, through a modern lens, right? And an important part of this myth, I think, is um, this modern myth-making milieu is Minotaur, right? This, who becomes an archetypal monster associated with um, the labyrinth often and, and the axe, the labyrinth double axe, okay. Uh, so Minotaur features across various modern genres and, and mediums, so um, whether it's historical fiction and um, top uh, top middle picture, Mary Renan's King Must Die, where um, an evil orientalized uh, sort of Prince Asterion is, represents Minotaur, right? Uh, science fiction, like in the two episodes of Doctor Who, the British sci-fi television series, long running, um, that's bottom left. Um, we have references to Minotaur in various horror stories, most famously maybe the King of Horror, Stephen King's Rose Meadow, where um, this abusive um, husband, rather like Jack in The Shining, has turned into a, a Cretan bull slash Minotaur um, figure. Um, we have literary fiction like Lawrence Darrell's Dark Labyrinth, right, where various English tourists are uh, taken on a touristic tour of um, a, a newly discovered labyrinth and get lost, and many of them die, and they, some of them hallucinate a, a minotaur in this labyrinth. We have minotaurs in fantasy, like C.S. Lewis's um, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and um, Minotaurs and various movie adaptions of those stories uh, depicted in the bottom right there, and that's the movie version of um, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Uh, we have Minotaurs and detective stories, like Agatha Christie's uh, The Cretan Bull as part of her 12-part story, that I think it's called The Labor, Labors of Heracles, Labors of Hercule, pardon, right? The Labors of Heracles. Um, we have mentors in computer games, such as Assassin's Creed in the bottom right there, right? Uh, in films such as uh, the Minotaur, the Wild Beast of Crete, in the top left there, right? So we have mentors in all these different popular genres and, and different mediums, film, computer games, novels, etc. in 20th century um, cultural texts. Uh, Minotaur, incidentally, can be realized in different form, in different sort of ontological levels. We have the uh, references to an actual monster, like in um, Stephen King's Rose Madder, where the, where the villain turns into an actual Minotaur. 
or like in Nikos Kazantzakis's um, at the palaces of, of Knossos, I believe it's, I think it's called, where um, there is an actual Minotaur residing in this historical fiction, which actually turns into a historical fantasy in a way, unlike Mary Renner's story. Uh, we have um, humans who are rather monstrous, like in Renault's story, and, and who are referred to as a Minotaur, right? Um, and we have the Minotaur as a psychological construct, as a sort of a, a hallucination, a figment of the imagination, of the delusional mind, like in Lawrence Darrell's story. Okay, so we're fascinated by, by Minotaur, we're really interested by Minotaur. Um, and here's one question of many is, is what do we do with Minotaur in these texts? Well, generally the idea seems to be that we kill the guy, we kill him. Okay, whether it's um, the historical epic, sand and, sword and sandal uh, epic, like on top left there, the wild beast of Crete, where the hero slays Minotaur, whether it's a horror story where this figure of terror is stopped, right? Must be slain. Uh, whether it's historical, it doesn't seem to matter on, on, on the genre, whether it's a psychological construct of Minotaur, still the protagonist must overcome this mental pathology and defeat his Minotaur, right? Overcome the, the labyrinth uh, and so on. Um, so there, generally the idea seems to be to, to kill the Minotaur, right? Uh, so why must we play the Minotaur softening these cultural representations? Well, He's obviously the bad guy. He's homicidal, right? He kills people with a, a big labrys, lovely double axe, a bit like Gimli's axe from Lord of the Rings. He, he's, he's not a nice guy, right? Um, fair enough. He's also, also um, associated with uh, sort of extreme masculine, primitive anger, rage, right? This draws on the imagery of, of bulls, um, right? And he's also associated in many texts with the sort of irrational sphere of the human mind. Okay, so all these associations contribute to these narratives of sort of uh, over, overcoming the, the, the primitive, irrational side of, hum of, of the human rights of, of experience and sort of advocating moral, harmonious, ordered, ordered narratives. Uh, so he's a bad guy, uh, but he's also different, right? He's just other. He, he's dysmorphic, so he has two forms of a bull's head and, and a man's body. Um, he lives in a, he doesn't live in a typical Oikos home. He lives in the underground, right? In the labyrinth. He's a chthonic creature, right? Like many monsters live in caves like Polyphemus. He doesn't live in, in, in a normal human habitation. He's um, sexually perhaps a bit strange. He's a product of an immoral act between his mother Pacify and the Cretan bull, right? Poseidon's um, sacred bull. And this, this corrupt act sort of um, breeds him, right? Uh, and so in, in the ancient logic, he is bad because he is sort of, he's other. He was created by this immoral, unnormative act, which created an unnormative being. And therefore he's naturally bad and he must be slain, right? Um, he's also cognitively strange in many of his stories. He can't communicate properly and so on. So he, he, the, the idea is that he's, he's different. Uh, and so I think many of the, the modern receptions, at least in the first half of, of the 20th century, with a few exceptions, perhaps um, under Gid's um, Thesse and to an extent Nikos Kazakis' story at the Palace of Knossos, children's story. Um, with some exceptions, most stories don't really seem to, um, to deconstruct this monstrosity of, of Minotaur in interesting ways. Um, as I said, he, he can be a psychological construct, but it still must be, be, be slain. Um, in recent times, there are some interesting rewritings of Minotaur. Um, I've called them loosely. I can't talk about all of them today. There's some interesting post-colonial um, rewritings, and there's also some interesting environmental rewritings, like in the Narnia stories. Uh, but I'm going to talk about postmodern mentors today. What I, what I mean by that is just um, narratives which are skeptical about this traditional notion of, of slaying otherness, right? This inherited notion, this classical notion that Minotaur must be slain. In, in these stories, um, the Minotaur isn't slain, right? And actually comes out generally on top, or at least there's a more complex narrative in, in, involved, right? Uh, so they question this narrative trope, this motif rather. Okay, 
Uh, so these are the three novels I'll be focusing on. So I'll give a quick summary of each since I don't have too much time. So on the left, we have a literary fiction, if I can use such a elitist term. Uh, Stephen Sherrill's The Minotaur Takes a Cigarette Break. Basically, this is the Minotaur, the only Minotaur from ancient Crete. He has some vague memories of his past in the labyrinth of, of his atrocities he committed, but now he's living in contemporary America. He works in a very typical American um, diner as a backroom staff who, who cleans the dishes, right? Um, and the novel takes us through his sort of quotidianal, everyday mundane experiences in modern America. Um, and there's a follow-up to this uh, written about four years ago called The Minotaur. This was written in 2000, and there's a follow-up written in 2016 called The Minotaur Takes Its Own Sweet Time. Also a very good read. I recommend it highly. Uh, center, um, detective story, uh, The Minotaur by Barbara Vine, um, nom de plume of uh, Ruth Rendell. A sort of typical English house and garden, a manor and garden sort of murder mystery, right, in the, in the detective genre. Uh, so basically... Um, there's no real Minotaur, but Minotaur is um, a middle-aged man called John Cosway, um, who is helped by a Swedish au pair who this family hires, uh, John Cosway's family, to, to watch over him because he's in some way not able to look after himself, right? But it turns out this family is really abusing this man, John Cosway, um, the mother and his several of his sisters because he um, stands to inherit the property. So they basically try to have him invalidated as mentally insane in order to inherit the property. So, and the, the narrator is sort of working against the, the, the mother and his sisters. So we have sort of this evil family who's trying to manipulate this Minotaur man, this middle-aged man, right? And lastly, Peter Goldworthy's a Minotaur. So Barbara Vines was written in 2005 and Peter Goldworthy's most recent 2019. Um, uh, definitely also highly recommend this one uh, if you want to uh, read it. It's a literary fiction also slash suspense thriller. So basically Minotaur here, again, metaphorically used, is a policeman, Australian policeman. The writer is Australian and it's set in Australia. I think it's set in somewhere near Adelaide, I think. Um, can't be sure of that. Um, okay, so the narrator is a policeman who was shot in a line of duty and uh, sustained an eye injury and um, was was blind after that uh, injury, right? And so the the, the story takes us through his um, uh, experiences, right? And so basically the story is that he is being stalked by the criminal who blinded him, right? Who um, was sent to jail because of this policeman's endeavors. He's escaped from jail and now he's stalking this minotaur blind policeman. Okay, and the story goes through this, uh, through this narrative ultimately with a happy ending. Okay, so that's our three stories. So, what's first noticeable is that these minotaurs aren't monstrous in obvious ways, right? So, that's clear in Barbara Vine and Peter Goldsworthy's story, where it's really the term minotaur is being used. Um, metaphorically, but also in the Minotaur takes a cigarette break, even though it's really the real Minotaur from myth, no one really notices his horns or his bullhead to such a degree. This is not um, really, the, it's, it's not uh, the monstrosity, the physical aspect is, is not really the, the main, uh, this is not the, the main focus of, of, of um, the story. Rather, all, all these individuals, these three Minotaurs, they all seem to suffer from certain disabilities. So the otherness is articulated in very modern scientific terms as sort of physical, cognitive or emotional disabilities, right? So in the case of um, Minotaur, and Minotaur takes a cigarette break, um, he experiences physical pain, which is described in very precise um, medical terms at this point where his body, he's, the man changes to the bull body, he's got intense physical pain, he suffers from sexual um, disorders, right? He can't function normally sexually. He suffers from speech impediments. He can't articulate himself properly, right? So this is all described in quite scientific ways uh, in, in medical terms. And because of these various uh, physical um, disabilities, right? He suffers from um, a sort of extreme debilitating social anxiety. He really struggles to uh, communicate and to, to act normally around other people. Uh, he also seems to suffer from PTSD, um, so a form of post-traumatic stress um, disorder because of his experiences in Crete, right? 
So he's got all these, these um, disabilities framed in modern terms. Uh, in Barbara Vine's Minotaur, it turns out, um, although the family was just treating um, this uh, middle-aged um, uh, man um, uh, as, as sort of a, a mad or deranged person, he actually had autism, which was sort of not diagnosed in a story which was set in the 1970s, but it's sort of the narrator who's talking retrospectively ad identifies as autism in John Cosway, right? So he's, he's got a definite disability, but it's not recognized by, by his family um, who are abusing him. Okay, and in Peter Goldworthy's story, um, it's blindness. As we, as I've said, he's got a different disability and it, it triggers rage. And so he has to go to anger, anger management therapy, right? So all these minotaurs, their problems are treated in very modern medical terms as, as definite disorders, blindness, autism, okay? Uh, PTSD, right? It's modern, they're really suffering from modern problems. It's, um, okay. Uh, so the question is, uh, well, I, and, and I think um, certainly an important part of these stories is that the, the narratives, the writers create empathy for the Minotaur. This is very important. We, we've seen the, uh, to react against this narrative of just slaying the Minotaur, that these stories are concerned with creating empathy uh, for, for, for the Minotaur. Uh, and ap apart from using scientific modern medical discourse to, um, to characterize their monstrosity, the otherness, uh, which creates empathy um, for modern reader. These stories also use various techniques to do that. So in, in the case of Peter Goldsworthy's um, brilliantly written story, the the writer actually um, uses focalization to, um, to focus on touch, right, and on hearing. And there's almost, there's very few visual indicators in, in the story, right, which which makes you see from the blind Benetton's perspective. Right, we can see where we'll get to the labyrinth imagery from here. Um, in the case of Barbara Vine's story, um, was a very empath empathetic narrator, the this, this Swedish au pair who looks after John Cosway, who's caring for him. And we see from her point of view, right, not from the family's point of view, trying to slay this monstrous mental, right. Um, and obviously, we have the victimization of um, the Minotaur by normative people, um, whether it's the family of John Cosway or the criminal who's trying to kill the Minotaur and Goldsworthy story, or the various um, modern day Americans who are laughing at and um, poking fun at, at Minotaur, Minotaur takes a cigarette break, right? So empathy is definitely created, but for me, these stories are about more than just empathy. They're about really the, the, the journey of these Minotaurs as individuals. Empathy can be kind of limiting, can be a bit even um, uh, con condescending towards Right, the victim, and and I think these stories are trying to take the minerals on a sort of a personal growth, and from 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 being right victims to um, to being to to, to en and engaging some kind of personal growth for, for going through their own personal stories, right, to reaching some more positive endpoint, whatever that may be. They vary in the stories. Um, okay. Uh, and to this end, I think the symbolism of the labyrinth, and, and here I hope I can touch on some, what some of the other speakers will say in this panel, is it, very important. Okay, so all three stories are using the idea of the Minotaur as being sort of stuck in the labyrinth in, in various respects. Imagery of the labyrinth is very important. Uh, so in Minotaur takes a cigarette break, um, here's a quote from the story at the end. It is as if the Minotaur is looking into the past and future simultaneously, and both are visions of desolation, of endless and murky emptiness, a labyrinth of days, a later quote from the story. So here's the idea that labyrinth isn't, it's a very complex novel. I really can't explain all of it now. It will need its own hour to discuss this, this novel, but um, the idea is that labyrinth isn't spatial, but temporal, and that the Minotaur being such a prehistoric creature has experienced such a labyrinth of days that he's not able to really disentwine himself from, from the past and the future ahead of him, that he's sort of lost in this labyrinth of time. That's a very interesting idea. Um, and John Cos for John Cosway in um, Bob Bravine's murder mystery story, in the actual house where he lives in is described as like a kind of labyrinth. Um, the house is very big, but they keep some of the rooms shut up. The causeways were good at keeping things hidden. So some quotes from the story there. And there is, in fact, an actual maze in the story. And the Swedish narrator tries to discover this, this maze, right? So there is a maze. And John Causeway is trapped in this house, right? Um, but it's not just a physical 
um, a physical labyrinth, but a sort of a psychological cognitive labyrinth. Um, so really the labyrinth is used as a, a metaphor for the autistic experience of not being able to sort of communicate, to find a way through the labyrinth of the mind. This idea was actually um, not first uh, arrived at by um, Barbara Vine or Ruth Randall, but actually by John Farris in a horror story called The Minotaur from 1985, who used the, um, the, the metaphor of a minotaur for a young autistic boy, right? So there's some idea of this mental being lost in a labyrinth as being appropriate to the experience of being autistic. Um, okay, and lastly, Richard Zadal, the main character of the policeman in um, Peter Goldworthy's story, is also trapped in a labyrinth. Um, almost one would say literally cognitively right a cognitive labyrinth because his physical blindness turns everything around him into a sort of a labyrinthine milieu okay and so the novel focuses on his various passages through this this, this darkness which he experiences um, and how he gets lost he loses track of the path his gps machine and he tries to find his way back on the right path sort of a metaphor for you know ariadne's thread um Okay, that's the sort of cognitive experience, right? Um, that's, his, that's his reality, right? Uh, but there's also a physical labyrinth, which is his house. He turns his house into a labyrinth for guests. He, he closes all the blinds, makes it extremely dark, and those who enter his house feel like it's a labyrinth. And he, he, he says, you know, the darker the better for his house. So it's, it's like a labyrinth. But also there's a, a labyrinth on another level, which is a sort of psychological mnemonic labyrinth. And um, basically he is, his injury means that he retains some, some snapshots of what he sees, but he doesn't process it in, at, 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 at the present. So he's got these sort of snapshots of what he sees going, uh, being processed in some deep part of his brain. And he's trying to find what these snapshots are. It's, it's a very interesting medical idea. Um, and so it, it's like he's searching through his brain for these for these snapshots, for these these memories, which can help him as a policeman to unravel um, and unravel the, the the story going on before him. Okay, so we have all different kinds of labyrinths: temporal, physical, cognitive, psychological. Right, so working on all different levels. But the idea is that these minotaurs are stuck in their labyrinths. Okay, and I'll just wrap up quickly by saying they must that these stories will have a, a, a positive um, uh, journey for these minotaurs, and that they they are hopefully finding some way out of, of this, um, of, of their labyrinths, right? And it's a story which moves therefore beyond just mere creating empathy for these minotaurs, which I think is present in some other stories in the early 20th century, is these monsters which should be pitied, or we should feel, um, feel with empathy and, and, and sort of um, narratives of victimization, but actually it's, it's more positive and personal than the growth which these characters, mentors experience. Um, and so for Minotaur and Mentor takes a cigarette break, this is really a journey of hope. Um, so however much he is sort of um, mocked and abused by his contemporary Americans, he retains hope. Really this focus on hope is a, the vital, um, his vital characteristic, his defining characteristic. Um, and it's a hope which doesn't orient towards the future, but really towards the, the present and focusing on, on small things in the present and, and small real connections with people and small moments in the present. And so here's a quote from the sort of epitaph of the novel. The Minotaur dreams that brevity of hearts in a labyrinth of days. The Minotaur dreams the second hand, the second hand spinning madly, right? So the seconds, right? Focusing on just the present, getting away from the labyrinth of his past and focusing on small moments, communicating with people in his present. Um, he, he often fails at these, uh, like with a, a romantic story um, within a subplot within this novel, but he keeps trying. And, and that's this journey of hope, which he's on. Um, for the Minotaur, John Cosby and Barbara Vine story, it's actually a journey towards rationality, right? So here's a quote from the Minotaur. They hunted the poor Minotaur and brought him out of, not the labyrinth, but the library, right? So actually the, the actual labyrinth in Barbara Vine's um, detective story is the library, right? Which is a place of knowledge. Um, and John Cosway, this autistic man who is abused by his family, finds refuge in this haven of classical knowledge. There's references to Longinus and uh, Library of Alexandria and Plato being preferred to the Bible in this library. And, and John is fascinated by classical learning. And so the image of the mentor as a classical creature um, is, becomes associated with actually rationality. And so John, this autistic man is, 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 is finding rationality within this labyrinth. Uh, this kind of works against ideas of the mentor as a figure of the irrational, right? 
uh, actually John Cosme's family, these normative people are actually the crazy ones who are trying to, um, right, uh, trying to, to have him put into asylum and are, are living really delusional, sad lives. Um, okay. And lastly, in Peter Goldsworthy's Minotaur, um, we have a kind of a therapeutic, a, this therapy of active action for, for the main character. He's not just passive, he's not just playing the victim, waiting in his labyrinth, right, to be, to be hunted by, by this criminal who blinded him, but he's actually trying to um, attack, actively attack um, this, his, his pursuer, right? Um, and so he gets, uh, he, he, through trickery, he manages to get this um, criminal to come into his house, into this labyrinth, and manages to overcome the criminal, right? Um, through his various cunning tricks. Uh, interesting, at, at the end of the story, he has the option of, of he has the idea of killing this criminal, but he, he shows mercy. So he, he doesn't resort to anger, which is an important theme of sort of the, the bull, right? It's not the idea of this, this minute of having unrepressed anger like in Dante's um, Inferno, but he, um, he shows mercy instead and chooses not to be angry. And he actually squeezes glue onto the eyes of his assailant and, and turns them into temporarily being blind and joining him in the labyrinth of his experience of, of, being, of being blind. Um, okay, so I, I think I have to stop there. So I hope you have some interesting responses to these stories and I can kind of suss out some of the meanings and details of these stories if you're interested and, and comment on them for you. Um, thank you very much for listening to me and I apologize for going uh, seven minutes over time. Thank you very much.